Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and um, thank you very much indeed for joining us for this mini summit, which is going to focus on active travel and um, and how we can build back better post the pandemic uh, with a with a particular focus on the north. So thank you very much for joining us. Just a reminder, the session is being recorded. Um, please post your comments and questions in the chat throughout, and please mute your microphone to reduce background noise. We have two fantastic panels here with us today. Um, our first panel is going to try and answer the key question, how can we build back better health and well-being in the North towns and cities on the road to net zero? And we have with us Pete Zanzotera. Zanzotera is what I want to say. Zanzotera, who is the Active Travel Project Director for Sheffield City Region. And Pete and I were lucky enough uh, to go on a school visit last week in Barnsley um, to celebrate Walk to School Week. So he's one of the few people um, that has actually we've managed to meet in the last uh, year. Uh, we have uh, Kerry McCarthy MP joining us, uh, the Shadow Minister for Green Transport. Uh, Kerry is uh, an MP in Bristol. And Dr Richard Nixon who is Programme Director for Cycling and Walking at Transport for Greater Manchester. Very exciting programme of um, cycling and walking beelines uh, going on in the city. Um, so I'm going to begin by asking Pete to um, say a few words up to five minutes and don't forget if you do have any questions or comments for our speakers do please put them in the chat. Oh and I should just say our second panel um, is going to have um, is going to hear from Caroline Flint um, and from Claire Haig, who is the director for Greener Transport. So we are going to have a, a fantastic discussion with you um, today. Thank you very much, Pete. Over to you. The floor is yours. Thanks. Um, uh, really good to see you last week, Mary. Yeah, uh, in in uh, a slightly uh, cold and uh, it, the rain held off in Barnsley, and it was really amazing to uh, walk to that school and to look at the local issues there and talk to the people. And I think that's partly what I want to uh, talk to everybody about. Um, we're clear in uh, Sheffield City Region, and I know Richard will be, be similarly clear that there are two things that we have to do. Um, we have to build some active neighbourhoods and we have to link them with active travel routes. I don't know whether you can hear somebody started drilling nearby. I'm really sorry about that. It's the neighbour. Um, and those bits of infrastructure are absolutely crucial because um, I'm quite old um, and I've lived through, uh, I think it's now four separate targets of the government to double cycling. And it hasn't worked any of those times. And the reason it hasn't worked is we've been around encouraging people to do things. And it's really not about encouraging, it's about making the infrastructure different. So it spells out a different uh, kind of signal. The commissioner, Dame Sarah Story and I are absolutely clear on this. And uh, Sarah was due to speak today. Unfortunately, she's got some GB athlete stuff that's really pressing for Tokyo. So the infrastructure is an absolute key bit of unlocking this. But the other thing that I really wanted to emphasize to everybody is the behavior change. Because I think in our heads, we think that people are suddenly going to step out of the car and say, do you know what, tomorrow I'm gonna walk and cycle and run to work every day. And that isn't what will happen. And it isn't what it has happened. And it isn't what is happening. What has happened in the last year is a whole raft of people have discovered that they can work in a different way. And we know that somewhere between 20 and 30 people, depending where you, 20, 30 percent of people, depending where you are in the country, will be working from home probably a lot more. We're, we're looking at two, three, twos, all kinds of weird and wacky formations. So the first thing is we know people have been spending more time in their local environment and because they haven't been able to travel anywhere else they've been doing other things and we know that the Ipsos Mori poll so shows that 20 percent of people are going to walk more often after the pandemic and lots of people have been walking around their local neighborhood uh, and uh, discovering things that they like discovering things that they don't like and I think that's that key part of this that people aren't going to stop driving 
and suddenly transfer that journey to walking and cycling. But what they are going to do is start living in a place that they care about more, meeting more local people, deciding to spend more time in their local neighborhood, really hopefully starting up more healthy businesses in our local neighborhoods, because I live in Armley Leeds, and um, people remember 30 to 50 years ago, having a shoe shop and those kind of things. And now we've got too many betting shops, too many cheap alcohol shops, lots of international supermarkets. And I just wanna point that towards what you see if you go to Walthamstow. If you go to Walthamstow, you see a transformed high street and people talk about gentrification, but actually there's some stands of local shops and some local pubs that have completely changed. But the betting shop has gone and what's happened is a cafe's turned up and it's, it maybe isn't the most gentrified cafe, but it is a cafe. And that this idea that people are gonna stop driving to work and start cycling to work was never going to be true and isn't true. But what we are going to do is create neighborhoods where people feel they belong. We're gonna create a generation of children that grow up learning to walk and cycle in their local neighborhood. Perhaps within our lifetime, their lifetime, we will be able to build the network that they can walk and cycle on and that they will be a generation of people that won't make those short journeys by car and will think about investing more time and effort in their local neighborhood. And I, I think when we think about that, we start to move away from this labeling other people's journeys as unnecessary and move towards a place where we welcome people into our place. We feel like we belong there. They feel like they belong there. They spend more time there and that's how we deliver this. Uh, so I, I hope that helps from where we're looking at things that we have to get the infrastructure, but the behavior change isn't the one that we thought it was gonna be. I'll just unmute myself. Brilliant, Pete. That's um, that's a uh, that's absolutely brilliant. There's some. I think on Teams you can send claps, but I don't quite know how to do it on Zoom. Um, but I, I know that we would be applauding you and um, some really interesting food for thought there around the behaviour change piece, uh, which obviously for us at uh, Living Streets is a, a really big part of this uh, solution. So I will come back. I've got I've got a couple of questions for you, but we're going to move on now to Richard Nixon, who is going to speak for five minutes. Well done for keeping perfectly to time and uh, just a message for our organizers that Kerry needs to be resent the link because she can't get into the meeting and she's just sent me a text. Richard the floor is yours. Thank you and as ever how do you ever follow Pete um, but I think really just to echo exactly what Pete said um, so what we know for example is that around 30 percent of trips in Greater Manchester under a kilometer are made by car we know that that's an equivalent of a five mile bike ride or a 15 minute walk. So we have got a massive opportunity to change behavior right now. We also know, as Pete said, that from COVID recovery surveys, people feel safer or have felt safer uh, on those quieter streets. And they've said they want to continue to travel more actively. I think one of the critical things we've got to engage with though, is the fact that Although it's undoubted that cycling and walking has major benefits for our high streets, as, as Pete's pointed out, the Walthamstow example is perfect. And we know that those traveling actively tend to spend more, they have higher frequencies of attendance in places, all those sort of things. One of the biggest challenges we've got is that although traffic on the major roads in Greater Manchester, for example, has barely risen in the last 10 years, Nobody ever asked the residents of Greater Manchester if they wanted two billion more miles being driven on residential streets in the last 10 years. And is, there's no debate and argument about that. There's no consultation occurred in the last 25 years about would you like 30% more traffic on your local neighborhood streets. So we've got a really big challenge to overcome here because actually despite the fact that, and I could reel off like Pete does more eloquently than me, a whole raft of stats about what people say they want to do. But one of the biggest challenges we have is that cultural impasse we have between what people say they would like to do and their aspirations. And then when we simply get on the ground with a simple proposal to make that positive change, the objections of a very vociferous minority can completely derail local 
and even strategic objectives. So I think one of the biggest things we have to do as a community of interest is actually change the dialogue about what this means. We are actively and proactively consulting with people, but they're not referendum. Uh, your DFT have made that very clear in the, in the recent round of active travel uh, uh, schemes, which is this isn't something that we are asking whether we should do. We are committed to making sure that we do do this. So we have to think about language and we have to think about the way we present the arguments that nobody ever asked those residents about the increasing traffic in their neighbourhoods. And yet we do face that challenge of having to consult on schemes in local neighbourhoods when we know that they have the benefits which the majority of people are telling us they would like to see. So 70% of 77% of Greater Manchester residents say that protected space on roads would help them cycle more. Um, so we are, as, as, as colleagues all know, committed to uh, an extremely uh, sizable investment programme. Um, and we are now, we have now one of the highest spends on cycling and walking per head in the UK at around £18 per head per resident every year. Um, we have more than 100 schemes on the books. Um, the plan is uh, we've had a recently re-elected Metro Mayor in, in Andy and we'll have something like 100 kilometres of new routes on the ground uh, by the end of this year. We'll have a bike hire scheme in place. We're also delivering those active neighbourhoods and we're looking now very positively at the opportunity from the DFT. But we won't achieve any of that if we don't achieve cultural change and behavioural change within the communities that we're focused on. So. Um, we do have a number of initiatives that leak, seek to promote that and look to speak to people in their own language about the links between their behaviour, health and the well-being of their communities. And I think that's the area that we really do have to focus on because um, the infrastructure itself we're trying to build is relatively straightforward, but actually the complex issue is more about achieving societal change so that we aren't stymied by consultation as I say, when nobody asked the communities of Great Britain whether you wanted to see this level of exponential traffic growth in their local areas. And that's a dialogue we have to change at a national, regional and local level. And it's going to take great commitment from our political leaders. Um, some of you are aware, I'm, I'm pleased to say that uh, Chris Boardman's been re, uh, recommissioned as not just the Cycling and Walking Commissioner, but the Transport Commissioner. And I think that really gives us an opportunity in the north to embed the idea that active travel is the first and last step of every journey that is desirable. So whether you're moving on by bus, moving on by train, moving on by tram or other modes, walking and cycling are the core and the bedrock of what we're going to try and do over the next five to ten years in the north. Brilliant. Absolute perfect timing. Um our, our two first speakers setting the bar on uh, uh, discipline and I believe that we are joined now by Kerry McCarthy. Um, some very interesting things um, to reflect on there Richard about the two billion extra miles that are going through the back streets. It's the kind of Waze and Google Maps disease isn't it? The sat nav disease where everyone's cutting through and this explosion where people haven't been consulted um, and, and, and sort of turning the lens back and saying actually how do we create communities for um, pedestrians and for cyclists uh, rather than creating communities for for cars which is what we've done um so it's it's about in, inverting that hierarchy um kerry are you are you here and can you uh join us i am here and i've got my video on but for some reason can you see me because no. i can't see myself on the screen so i've definitely taken off the the stop video thing i've definitely unblocked it at the top so it's not my day tech i've been waiting on a team's call i got sent a team's link for the meeting which is where i've been for the last 10 minutes um so i don't know why people can't see me um i can't think of any good reason it um, might be because so you've been on a team's link and so your video is still connected into the teams this too has you, happened to me you um, are a genius and that is exactly the answer so I've now just come off the Teams thing and I'm pretty sure that's the answer because I was still on that. Um, so but, I, you might need to go, we might need to rejoin you or you might need to rejoin us. Ha, bingo. Go. Sorted, sorted. 
Thanks. Yeah, I hate Teams and uh, it's, yeah, I'm quite glad it's on Zoom, but we, we got there in the end. So I'm not always so technologically incompetent. So I'm sorry I missed the early speakers. I'm also sorry that I've got to leave before the end because I'm hosting something else. But um, don't I'm worry, it's wonderful. To, it's great to see you. While, so. The floor is yours. OK, um, yeah. So um, in terms of yeah, the, the key question is about how we can build back better health and well-being in the north towns and cities on the road to net zero but then I was specifically asked about the acceleration to greener and active travel and there's so much that I can say on it in terms of the green transport brief but um, I'll try and just sort of canter through the the main things I mean in terms of cycling and walking the government did announce this two billion pounds package last year um, and they're meant to have this target to double cycling and increase walking by 2025. I said they're meant to have this target. They've got this target, but targets don't mean very much unless you actually got a, a sort of roadmap to get there. And the problem with this two billion is it's been released in sort of sl small tranches. And there was some money for the emergency you know, pop up bike lanes and other infrastructure during um, the pandemic last year. But as I understand it now, you know, it's a five year um, package and the next tranche won't be released until the spending review in the autumn. My argument would be that if we're trying to get to this 2025 target, we need to release that money as soon as possible and not in dribs and, and drabs. The DFT has commissioned research which suggests that actually six to eight billion pounds worth of investment will be required to get us to those targets, but it's refusing to publish that, that research. Um, there was the gear change white paper, which was very well received. Um, the Prime Minister said that it would kick off the most radical change in our cities since the arrival of mass motoring, um, but no funding has been announced for any of gear changes 33 commitments. So again, we're pushing on that. What we're actually seeing in terms of some of the political mood music is um, quite a pushback. I mean, I think it's part of these cultural wars that, you know, the cultural wars that we're hearing about. I mean, Jacob Rees-Mogg virtually every week at Business of the House Questions talks about the war on motorists and criticise councils that are bringing in low traffic neighbourhoods, which is obviously flying in the face of what his government's meant to be doing. Um, Grant Shapps even recently criticised schemes which took away road space for motorists, um, despite that being what the government's meant to be achieving. And there is going to be a real debate to be had about if you want things like priority bus lanes, um, if you want space for active travel, and it's not just going to be cycling, it's going to be e-bikes, e-cargo bikes, e-scooters. We've got a really successful pilot going on in Bristol at the moment, which has got about 1,200 e-scooters um, in use. But under the, the VSO that was negotiated with the government, um, we could have seven and a half thousand scooters. It just depends on the council giving permission for the numbers to increase. But because the pilot seems to be going well, we look at an increase. That's without the you know, nationally some like 300,000 private e-scooters um, on the road, despite being illegal. And there's a real delay to the government in terms of um, uh, bringing forward legislation on that. So these e-scooter pilots have now been extended yet again to next March. And... Um, there might be legislation next year, but meanwhile, people are buying these e-scooters for their own use. Um, the government has a target to have half of all journeys walked or cycled by 2030. But I've been pressing them to try to sort of say, does this depend? Are they also focused on reducing traffic levels overall? Because, again, there's meant to be this UN goal, but they just say it's a matter for the local highway authority. So there's no clear goal in terms of reducing yeah, mechanised, motorised transport. Um, in terms of cycling, you, you'll know, um, you know that there's a fear from many people. Um, in the, the last official British social attitude survey, 66% of people said um, either agreed or strongly agreed that it was too dangerous for them to cycle on the road. Um, People did feel more comfortable doing it during the pandemic, but now that the traffic's getting back to normal, that's difficult. Um, what we've seen, you know, in, in terms of, you know, what's happening in some of the the, the northern cities, I know, you know, Chris Boardham's, Boardman's all, already been mentioned. Um, Transport for Greater Manchester's got this B network, which is walking, cycling routes for every community. And there was some resistance. I think when you're trying to bring 10 boroughs together, it can be difficult. But, you know, as I gather that, that's mostly been 
overcome. Um, just quickly, some of the other things we're pushing for, um, cycling as a core part of the national curriculum in the same way that swimming is. Um, the, uh, there was a YouGov report commissioned by Halfords that said um, that a majority of parents would support this, but the government's refusing to do this. Also pushing for the waiving of VAT on maybe bicycles across the board, but at least children's bicycles, but um, governments push back on that. And the final thing is um, changes to the cycle to work scheme. So at the moment, people on the minimum wage or thereabouts are excluded from it, the self-employed are excluded from it. Um, because if, if you're on the minimum wage, if it brings your income because it's take, deducted before your income comes in, it's it's deemed to take you below the legal level. So you don't qualify for it. And like I say, self-employed don't. Um, and we're also talking to disability groups about how they can access those those schemes as well. You know, if they're not in, in work, you know, it, it, it works in favour of people that, that pay tax and you get a bigger discount if you pay the higher rate of, rate of tax. So it seems a bit unfair that a scheme that's meant to increase the affordability of something excludes the people that are least able to afford it. Brilliant. Yeah. Some really um, important messages there around social justice and, um, you know, in, in, in terms of access to, to active travel there uh, around children and, and people on low incomes. And of course, it is people who live in the in the poorest neighbourhoods who disproportionately don't have cars, but have the air pollution impacts from other people's travel choices. Um, so there's some really important thing that uh, uh, thoughts for us there. I'm going to post in the link um, a report that we published last week on pedestrian risk and the links, uh, at, which is higher in poorer communities. Um, so, it you know, we looked at the top 10 percent richest neighbourhoods and the poorest neighbourhoods and it doubles for the poorest neighbourhoods. But it trebles if you're black in terms of the real the risk of being uh, killed or injured as a pedestrian. And there's something there that needs further unpicking in terms of is it where people live is it their shift patterns what what is happening there um that that makes it so much uh, higher risk uh, for, for poorer people and for uh people from black asian and minority, minority ethnic groups um we have our first question from ruth galletley i hope i'm pronouncing that uh, correctly from west yorkshire area that I know very well. Most of the still adequate active travel budget gets spent on infrastructure and mostly cycling. Small proportion is dedicated to behaviour change with a tiny amount devoted to evaluation of the longer term impact of many schemes. Coming from a background in evidence-based medicine, it seems extraordinary. We haven't established a rigorous evaluation process. This would help gather evidence on what works best. This is something interesting. We do have evidence with our travel tracker in schools at Living Streets that a 20 23% reduction in uh, all the way car journeys and a 30% increase in walking journeys. But there is something here, isn't there, about investment in infrastructure and measurement. Who'd like to answer that? Perhaps I could come back to Pete or Richard on that. Hi, Mary. Yeah, I, I'm, I, I was, uh, I, I know uh, Ruth. Uh, Ruth is on, on the local Living Streets group. Um, I, I live in West Yorkshire, but work in South Yorkshire and she's dead right. Um, when we started the active travel programme in uh, South Yorkshire, I was at pains to point out that 10 times as many people walk regularly as cycle regularly in South Yorkshire and a 10% change in either of those two numbers therefore is 10 times as much in walking. Um, so absolutely yes. Um, I think there is a slight com uh, a, a complication about spend but we, we have to go back. The government gear change document, everything written through the, uh, the government at the moment is cycling in brackets and walking. And we really do need to shift the dial. So absolutely, we need to do that. I'm, uh, I'm really pleased that some of my local authorities have really got this. In Sheffield, we have a Dutch star roundabout going in for the cyclists and the pedestrians, but we have a walking route from Burngreave into the city centre as part of the same scheme. And um, I, I think the movement towards active neighbourhoods is one where we can really see the infrastructure that does benefit walkers. And I, I think uh, uh, Ruth and all of us that work in pedestrian uh, priority will know that the actual that the, the stuff we have to do for, for pedestrians is is actually not that sexy most of the time. But one of the things we have done in South Yorkshire is to talk about spreading the inconvenience. You look at every junction that's created. What do we try and do? We optimise the traffic flow. 
and then we optimize the we optimize the other users and the walkers come by the end and we get these multi-stage crossings with pedestrians suffering multiple cumulative delays where do they have to wait right in the middle of the traffic lane where the pollution and the danger is the highest so we have a few crossings um, in south yorkshire that are already in and a whole lot more planned that are straight across in a single phase. And it's that kind of thinking, understanding the delay and inconvenience that we heap upon pedestrians and how we can undo that by really simple measures straight across crossings in a single phase. And yes, we have to spread that inconvenience therefore. And therefore, some people in vehicles are going to have to wait a little bit longer. But I think I go back to what Richard was saying, all of these vehicles that have been heaped into our local neighborhoods undermine the place. If we want to create a place where people want to be, uh, Jan Gell said this, uh, you know, most, ho most housing estates are built with the roads first. So what we do is we give people a way of getting out of the housing estate first. What we want to do is create a housing estate where they want to stay and, and it has a 15 minute neighborhood. So you, you're right, Ruth, to point it out. I think we're partly on the way um, I, I wouldn't say we're wholly on the way, and maybe Richard could answer how they're getting on with this, because I know it's been a journey for them too. Brilliant. I'm, I'm, just, con I'm just conscious Kerry's got to go very shortly. Kerry, would you like to just give us your final closing thoughts on some of this issue? I mean, spreading the inconvenience is, is a great way of putting it. Um, Behaviour mm -hmm. change, active travel, where does the pedestrian come in this? I think it's very right. And I think, you know, some of the sort of very basic things, which I think we, we've talked about before, is things like signage. So if somebody arrives at the main railway station, if they've got a sign showing the direction of the city centre and how long it takes to get there or to key landmarks, they're far more likely to be. I know people have apps on their phone and that, but I don't think it's quite the same as just saying, you know, it's just half a mile down that way. Um, I think we do, yeah, this whole question about shared space and how we make room for things. I know, you know, ideally you want the, the cycles and the scooters and everything in, um, in segregated bike lanes because there's a real issue once pedestrians get involved. And even when you do have the cycle lanes, there's still points like crossings and just certain intersections where um, it's not just that um, cyclists are a danger to pedestrians. Actually, pedestrians have a real habit of walking around looking on their phones without realizing the cyclists or the scooters are, are, are come in. So you have to, to swerve as well. And I know certainly in London, some of the big crossings, I'm sure you've done it, Mary, when you've been cycling around, you know, you're you're trying to weave in and out of pedestrians. So I think I think, yeah, we need to I think pedestrians are an afterthought and people just sort of assume that they can work their way around everyone else that's there. Um, we, yeah, we shouldn't forget the, the sort of disability issues and you know so things like the e-scooters again that I mentioned if you're parking them on the pavement if you've got this rather than being able to and this was the discussion I was having with the mayor of Bristol on Friday that we should be taking out car parking spaces and using those to park your 10 scooters or whatever rather than running the risk of them cluttering up pavements pavement parking is another issue as well which is it's, it's very easy to sign up to the principle of saying pavement you know stop stop pavement parking and um, which is entirely right but actually you know people will know from representing areas with lots of sort of terrorist streets which weren't really designed for car ownership what a difficult issue that is but but uh, yeah I think that whole question about how we use public space and yeah what gets squeezed and um is, is a really important one and um yeah Thanks for raising the issue of pavement parking, because, of course, it's illegal in London, but legal yeah. outside. Well, theoretically, very hard to enforce outside yeah. London. So we're hoping for news from the government on that. And, and that's been one of um, our big campaigns. We also are going to be campaigning on cutting the clutter, as you say, um, you know, cycle parking, A boards, etc. Very, very difficult. And we've seen with social distancing that most of our pavements aren't fit for purpose. You can't socially distance on most pavements in the UK. Some rural areas, you know, I'm thinking about some of the some of our old mining villages literally no pavements built yeah. um, straight I, from the terrace to the street yeah and I think with the increase in HMOs as well and the increase in bins you know it's a, it's a massive if you've got places turned into flats and then you've suddenly got all the bins out on the streets or the fly tipping all the, all those sort of issues um it's all about how we you know um uh how our urban space hasn't adapted to people's changing living circumstances but it can be very difficult when you're not designing from scratch
That's right. And Richard, we've heard from TfL um, this week. I think they're going to be putting in the def there's, there's some um, default green man crossing. So the, the crossings are set to green, green person, sorry, green person authorities. We've experimented with that in London. We did the X crossing at Oxford Street, seeing the sales increase at Nike Town by 30 percent when people could get across just those extra couple of seconds. Oh, I will just pop in. I will just have a look. So, you know, the spreading the inconvenience piece. Um, what are the lessons from Manchester here? So, uh, I mean, I think the behaviour change piece is absolutely vital. So on the issue of um, of pedestrians in particular and achieving genuinely active neighbourhoods or low traffic neighbourhoods, I think there's a couple of messages we need to get across there. One is we need the support from government and the DFT in particular to allow us to introduce European style side road zebras. Uh, and colleagues will know that we are on with our research report with TRL. Um, sad to say it isn't entirely clear what direction the DFT will go on that in terms of supporting any change to legislation but we're committed to continuing to support those trials so that changes the uh, fundamentally changes the hierarchy of road users in a space because in local neighborhood areas there's absolutely no reason why a pedestrian or somebody wheeling or scooting or however they're moving around not necessarily on a bike can cross a road that's fundamental I think behaviour change as well is another complicated thing as well, because I think we need to get people, get ourselves into the mindset, unfortunately, that we're all probably busy, active people who think nothing about a mile walk, a two mile walk, a five mile bike ride to get around and about town, because we understand the benefits to ourselves in health and mental well-being. A lot of the communities we're talking about actually don't walk further than the end of their their, you know, even if they've got a drive, the end of their drive, they don't walk to their local shop. Car journeys, I think, as Pete's pointed to, you know, of, of, of 500 metres, uh, you know. So we've got to work very hard with communities who uh, we're trying to engage with. So we're doing that, for example, through some funding from the London Marathon Charitable Trust. Um, I think the comment in the chat was about the level of investment. Now, we've deliberately focused revenue funding into behaviour change programmes, particularly around access to walking and cycling. and access to communities so that they can co-design with us solutions for their own local area. Um, so I think that's really important that we don't forget that the people we're talking about, people on bikes, people on foot, people wheeling or scooting are people, uh, as Pete said, who um, actually don't do any of the things that we logically would expect them to do at this moment in time. So some of that has to be about us managing the way we talk about language and I go back to that point about consultation we aren't closing roads to vehicles we aren't stopping motor traffic we're opening them up to people people who cycle people who walk people who scoot people who want to play talk uh, etc so I think as a community we also have to think about our use of language when we engage because there's a massive fear of change out there amongst communities because this is a change that we're expecting people to engage with over the next five or 10 years. And it's quite a fundamental change to our society. If you look at the volumes of short trips, 30% of those trips are under a kilometre made in a car. That's a quarter of a million, uh, sorry, 250 million trips a year. And that's a massive uphill climb to reduce back from. However, as Pete said, key thing we can't forget is that the second biggest mode arguably the biggest mode, if, depending on how you measure it, but the second biggest mode by the traditional measurements that we have in the UK, we, in Greater Manchester, is on foot. And, yeah. you know, so the biggest gains in terms of shift can be made. We're beginning to track and see some really interesting features of the recovery. Uh, our, our cycling figures are going up, but our walking figures are going up faster. Brilliant. Some really interesting food for thought there. We did some research with YouGov last week and as part of our Walk to School Week activity, and we asked people what measures they would be prepared to support um, to, to help uh, children travel safely to school. Would, you, would they be prepared to see um, streets closed? We never asked that question before. 64% of people said yes. I mean, you know, when you read the newspapers, that's not coming out. This is a YouGov thousand, you know, proper, properly representative panel. So some really interesting things there and asking people what they enjoyed about walking uh, during the lockdown. It's, it was like the only thing that people could do. And uh, most people saying they're gonna carry on doing it for physical health. And the second biggest reason was mental health. 
people were not talking about net zero carbon and they weren't talking about saving money. So there's some really interesting health messages in this as well. So we're going to move on to our next panel. Thank you to our first panel. And I'm delighted um, to be able to introduce um, Right Honourable Caroline Flint, who is the co-chair of the Getting to Zero um, panel as, uh, as part of Onward, which is a think tank which is looking at new solutions uh, to current problems. So we're really uh, thrilled to have you here with us, Caroline, and looking forward to what you have to say. Over to you. Caroline, you need to unmute. Sorry, I thought that was being done by the organiser. There we are. We have to multitask these days on these calls, don't we? OK, so I'll start again. So I am co-chairing um, a cross-party steering group um, with Caroline's, Dame Caroline Spellman on getting to zero. And our focus has been very much on looking at the jobs and the economy. Um, but that obviously plays into this whole discussion as well, because you know, part of how gathering work is how do you get to work and how do you get home from work as well? And, and then wrapped around that our social lives as well. Um, so I, I, I'll start by just saying, and just listening to what colleagues have already said, I think there's lots of examples of good ideas and that hasn't arisen just out of uh, the fact that we have to become cre greener and cleaner for the future. It's also been uh, an ongoing conversation about our health. And as a former public health minister, I can remember back in uh, the sort of mid 2000s, uh, part of my job was also to look at how we could help people to be fitter. And I have to say, my biggest concern was, um, obviously I want everyone to be healthy, but my biggest concern was that public health policies and actions would basically make the fit fitter and not really address those who are most in danger of having a shorter lifespan and a, a lifespan that was of less quality, to be honest, as well, than many other people. Um, and, and I think sometimes within this, there are big decisions that only government can make. But then to really get into the sort of detail of our different communities and the, you know, the diversity within those communities, the types of communities that people live and work in, that's where devolution can play a, a big role because Whitehall can't um, somehow have a one size fits all that lays over that. So if I give you an example of a big decision when I was public health minister was the decision to um, ban smoking in, pub in closed public places. Um, and I'm, that's what I think that's probably the proudest thing I ever did as a politician and was involved in. But it was also backed up um, by a huge number of local activities and strategies. Uh, to um, make sure that we were talking, first of all, to those people who were smoking, rather than just, you know, tap, slapping everyone on the back who wasn't, but also understanding what it was that meant that some of our services in health, in local authorities and in, and in, in, in other services just weren't reaching them and, and their families. So I think that's important to say at the outset about this, because I think it is that mixture of big profile, big profile policies that um, have to um, have be impactful, but also how you back it up on the on the ground. And importantly, this cannot just be about um, the worried well. It has to be something that speaks to people and doesn't turn them off. And as of course, there's lots of good ideas. I'm going to challenge a bit in terms of what's been said, if that's OK, Mary. I've listened carefully to what people have said, and I don't want to generalise too much, but a lot of the ideas are very city centric. Um, in some respects, they are about making it easier for those already cycling or walking um, uh, to do even more. And I have to say, a lot of the policies um, work for those who are more affluent, more middle class and who are working in white collar jobs. I, I mean, I was looking at something in London because that's come up. Uh, and I have to say, Walthamstow is not the same as Rosington as a town community in South Yorkshire compared to London. It's part of a, a very city urban sprawl with 24 tube lines and 24 bus hour bus services. It's very different. But someone was telling me the other day about the fact that in London, some boroughs have created low traffic side roads, which has been good for everybody in those side roads, but it's meant that more traffic is going on the main roads. And the people who live on those main roads are low income, low value housing compared to the side roads. Now, you know, I, I understand the idea behind that, but we have to really think through some of the consequences of some of the policies that we might be in danger of designing in 
that fundamentally don't benefit the very met people we really most need, need to reach. Um, I just want to share with you all a, a little bit of information as well, which I think is really important for the north of England. Um, and that's in relation to jobs and not having a job we've got to replace those jobs with something better that is a massive challenge but there is also a massive opportunity is that we can change the way in which people work and have jobs that are cleaner and greener if we're talking about behavioral change and communications there's a way there's an in within that conversation to talk about the communities in which those jobs reside and how we connect what they're doing in work being different to what they can do in their personal and, and community-based lives as well. And, and I think that's just another way of us tapping into the opportunities here. The other research I just want to share with you as well is that um, more than half, as I said, more than half of high emitting jobs are located in the North Midlands and Scotland. This is an interesting one. The more rural a constituency is, the more its local economy relies on high emitting jobs. That's nearly half the top deciles of constituency by high emitting jobs are classified as rural or towns, while just a quarter are in cities. So to make a successful transition to net zero, and that includes how we move around, how we get from place to place, it's got to be one that works for towns and villages, not just cities. And I think I hope we'd all agree it has to be rooted in the reality of people's everyday uh, lives. Um, Many white collar workers and public sector workers during the pandemic have worked from home on full pay and many may continue to do so. But in a lot of our towns and village communities, people work in trades, manufacturing, retail, also our hospitals and policing and, and hospitality. That is not the future for them. They are going to have to move to get to work. They're not going to be able to do it all from home. So whether it's planning jobs or improving health count outcomes, Success for me are, are, is policies that tackle these tough challenges. There are huge positives in more cycling and walking, but we shouldn't kid ourselves that on its own, it's going to reduce health inequalities. So let me just take my home borough. Doncaster is one of the most deprived boroughs in the country, it's, but it's got higher car ownership than London. People die 10 years earlier than those in Surrey and with 10 less good years of health. Now you'd think cycling and walking might be a no-brainer, but we have acute health problems with the use of mobility scooters, probably very highest in the country, even amongst those under 50. Now, one of the reasons people walk and cycle less is because unlike a city, we have 88 strung out communities. And for most, they see it as unrealistic to use active travel to get to work and amenities. I fought hard when every bank was being closed in my villages um, to stop that happening, to no avail, I have to say. Um, but actually, they haven't got the sort of amenities on their doorsteps uh, that stops them getting into the car. This is another interesting fact for those who live in cities. Doncaster is the biggest metropolitan borough in the country. It has a larger geographical footprint than Leeds or Sheffield. And I live in one of those 88 uh, towns or villages that make up the borough. So again, you can't construct in Doncaster and many other places in the north a private solution uh, to greening transport. The average used car value across the country is £8,000. In Doncaster, I imagine it's less. And therefore, these people are not going to be able to afford an electric vehicle without some sort of scheme to make that realisable for them. Um, 
Moving on I'm to gonna, I'm, we're just, yeah. I'm gonna okay. have to we're gonna have okay. to wrap it, okay. wrap it up there. There's lots so of I just things. wanted to say three things about walking and cycling young people. Um, I would say that um, for parents, what we've had success in locally is in villages using a local pub for people to park the car and then they walk to school from that pub or community centre. I would say in every school, the daily miles should be a feature, just like the literacy hour used to be a feature. And the other area is about for health and family support. If you don't influence the first thousand and one days of a child's life and the parents' involvement in that, you're not going to have the foundation for what you can do with that to get to school. So I think those are three areas, actually, in which you could really make some real inroads, but they lean into where people live and their lives they currently have, rather than expecting them to basically switch on a light bulb and change to something uh, for them, which they see as unattainable. Thank you, Mary. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Some important messages there around uh, the importance of a just transition and on social inclusion. Some very interesting work um, from um, the London boroughs and the low traffic neighbourhoods work, Brent and Hackney really leading the way in locating them in areas of very high deprivation. So the kind of middle, it's, it doesn't become a middle class leafy thing. It becomes actually something that everyone is able to enjoy. And some interesting things you say about cycling for the super fit and some comments in the chat about, um, you know, who are we building it for? And what you'd see is so, somebody said on a, a call the other week that women cyclists are the indicator species for for healthy neighborhoods because you know we all know that men are brave and like cycling but there's a kind of almost like the more women you see cycling the healthier you know it is and the safer that women feel it's a bit like salmon in a river if you have salmon in the river you know you've got a healthy river and I think there's something really interesting and locally where I am we do now have an LTN it's also under fives cycling on the road with their parents and it's like that is not something that I was comfortable doing uh, as a parent but people locally now feel comfortable doing that so it's 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 not just um it's, it's kind of how are people are their kids playing out do they feel free um is is there that freedom but some very important lessons there about uh, of course that you know it has to go hand in hand with uh, public transport i'm going to move on very quickly to our final uh, speaker claire Haig, chief executive of greener transport solutions sorry claire I, I forgot the solutions when i introduced you first time around um but the floor is yours Thank you very much, Mary. I've really been enjoying this discussion. And it's, yeah, I'm, I, I, this, some key takeaways. The spreading the inconvenience is a lovely expression, which I know I'm going to be using. I think my comments, I mean, building back better, you know, health and well being, achieving net zero, I see the two as absolutely fundamentally linked. Um, because what we need to be doing is evolving our transport system from its current carbon intensive high polluting inequitable state to a more sustainable and inclusive system um, which is you know kinder to our health and kinder to the environment and they are absolutely linked um, you know and it's very interesting there are key equity issues and I, there's, there's a lot that I, I would love to say and I'm conscious that that we've, the time is short so I'm going to really get to a few key messages um, so the, the key thing from from our perspective um, is moving away and is as part of this dis discussion is that massive benefits and really from moving away from the rover reliance on the private car um, obviously helping net zero which is very much what we're about at greener transport solutions but the major health benefits 40,000 early deaths a year caused by road transport um, or sorry for air pollution the majority of which is caused by road transport um, you know some and, and obviously sustainable travel is going to be key to attacking tackling our obesity epidemics our loneliness epidemic all other social ills and indeed to reducing congestion so it's it, these things that we see that absolutely linked but to move away from the spreading the inconvenience which has all been about a system which has been built around the convenience of the car and that's what that's what we are picking up the pieces of in all the discussion it's all about this is we're just trying to kind of it's deck chairs on the titanic the titanic has been a, sh a ship that has been sailing to the convenience of the car we, is, is this going to require fundamental changes in how we plan for transport? Um, so I think there are a number of key themes that we've been working on, which very much feed into this discussion. I mean, the first thing is that looking at the decarbonisation of transport is that we've got to look at the economy as a whole. I mean, obviously build on what we've learned from the pandemic. Um, Transport is not an end in itself, it's a derived demand. So we can build on what we've learned through um, digitalization, in online shopping, working from home, et cetera. Although as, as, um, as just 
um, Caroline was just saying very pertinently, before we get too carried away on all this homeworking, uh, there are many jobs, and the Institute, Institute for Fiscal Studies has done some great analysis on this, that you know just simply can't um, be worked from home. So that we, we just let's just remember we've got to speak for the whole population. Um, land use planning is key. I mean, a lot of what we, we talk about the sort of 15 minute or 20 minute neighborhoods, and, but get putting in the foundations for this at the core when we build new housing developments so we don't repeat mistakes from the past where we're just building in congestion. So these are sort of wider whole systems approach. The next thing, and, and it's been touched on this morning and today in the, and, the, and in this session is devolution. We have to strengthen devolution. The right framework involves empowering local leaders to plan for housing jobs, transport, and everything else skills on an integrated long-term basis. We've got to move away from the short-term fragmented nature of much local funding where we, all these pots and awards, it's just so inefficient, impossible to have a strategic plan that works for the area if you're relying on these dribs and drabs. Um, so it will, that is, that is a kind of a fundamental, better, greater devolution. And of course, um, we've got to be absolutely clear, and this really feeds into the discussion today, that technological solutions alone will not get us to net zero. I mean, everyone, it's, it's lovely to talk about greening the fleet. That's politically very easy. Um, you know, we're just asking people to buy a different car. We are also asking them to use it a lot less. Um, but that's that, that needs to come in. But but truthfully, we have got to reduce the sheer volume of traffic on our roads if we're going to hit those targets. Um, so that's a, so the behaviour change and encouraging that switch from private transport to public shared and active travel um, is at the heart of it. Now we hear it talked about. We've got to go much further. So I've been asked specifically to just look at some of those policies and incentives. Um, and there's a number we've talked on, uh, touched on a, a number of them in, in the discussion already, so I won't repeat what's already been said. I'm going to, um, in terms of in pedestrians, the road hierarchy, we need to have the pedestrian at the top. At the moment, it's in, we need to invert that because the triangle is the wrong way around at the moment. But to achieve the kind of change that we really need, we've got to ensure that we that fares and taxes encourage people to make lower carbon choices. And what we what we're dealing with is the failure of road taxation to cover externalities. You know that we overconsume our roads. I mean, the fact that successive governments have failed to put a penny on the price of fuel duty shows you this is very contentious. It's not an easy area. Um, but we do now, and this is really relevant right now, we face a new dilemma because we've got this 50, 40 billion black hole coming um, when, or when eventually the Treasury will not be receiving fuel duty and VED receipts. What's going to happen? You know, in the absence of that being replaced, I'll tell you what, road infrastructure will be funded out of general taxation, which means that non-car users, many often, very many on low income, will be subsidising um, people on higher income. You know, that's not fair. Um, and it, it's, wrap it up. I really, so I, in fact, I am just at my final punchline, really, which is that we, this, we have a, with the switch to EVs, we've got a brief window of opportunity to make a change, to have a conversation with the public to make a change about how we pay for road use. I'll leave it there, Mary. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I don't really know where to, uh, we've got various, um, I think Pete wants to come back in on cycling numbers in Doncaster. Um, we've got um, the denormalisation of hopping in the car to school, um, lots of linking up between health and um, cycling. Pete, do you just want to come back in on the, the Doncaster piece? I always, always worry about Sheffield because of those hills and, and how on earth anyone would manage to tackle them. Um, but maybe we can, uh, we can have a quick one minute sort of conclusion from each of our, our colleagues. So let's start with uh, Pete and Richard, then Caroline and Claire. Um, I, I don't really want to spend a lot of time talking about cycling in Doncaster. It is the highest in the region, though, uh, uh, so it has got something to cry about, but we've got a long way to go. And um, uh, it, Caroline's dead right. Rossington is one of these places that's out, uh, 10k out from the centre of Doncaster. It's not an easy route in. There are some routes that have just been built and the, the, there's a new bridge to go in that will link Rossington to the iPort. So there are some really good things to do in Doncaster and um, we, we are looking to get much more of a network built in Mon Doncaster and I'm really looking forward to that. So uh, what I'm saying is, um, Caroline, let's get together, let's get Dame Sarah across and let's, um, let's try and do everything we can for your constituency uh, and, and Doncaster as an area. It's got a huge amount to celebrate. It's got big, big issues, she's dead right, but the local delivery pilot is one of the national flagships that shows how health can engage 
across the board with communities in a much more productive way. So I, I think it's really good. And, I, and I, I'm not trying to dispute what Caroline says. I was just in the region. It's uh, something something to look up to. Thanks very much, Pete. Uh, Rich, Richard, do you want to just come in quickly on um, what you've heard, reflection, social justice, just transition, social inequalities? Yeah, I mean, I think like Peter, I mean, I actually, I think Caroline was absolutely spot on. And I think actually what a lot of us are talking about is it's not about the 10K journeys between, you know, major city centres or even the kind of leafy gentrification of urban areas. Um, it, it can be as simple as everyone's got a neighbourhood, everyone's got a 500 metre, 1000 metre journey to a school. And how do we make it more normal? to not jump in the car for those journeys? How do we make that part of people's healthy lifestyle choices? I actually think a lot of this, and I slightly disagree with Claire to some extent, I don't think it's a transport problem. I think it's a more broad societal problem. And in fact, one of the challenges we've always had in the transport profession is getting health and other sectors to positively engage in this as a societal and behavioral issue. Uh, Pete mentioned local pilot. We've had some great successes at local pilot level within within health side of things. And I think if we're going to win the argument, it is at that community level. It's about neighbourhoods. It can be in villages and town and local centres. It's about making it just that little bit easier to make the right choices. Because small amounts of uh, success on on you know just more people walking more often would be transformative initially. Because once they start walking then you can begin to build up their capacity to improve in that walking. I think my other concern as well is that the, the kind of, I stylize it as Cavmageddon as opposed to car Carmageddon. There's a lot of talk at the national, regional, and even local level about EVs and the kind of universal panacea that they will be. The problem is for us as professionals in this function, they won't solve congestion, they won't solve severance, and they won't solve uh, some of the issues around road safety in the short term, particularly while there's a mix of vehicles that are both ICE fueled and EV. So that's a really big challenge for us that all of a sudden it looks like that's the universal panacea. So we don't need to worry about all this green nonsense of walking and cycling. And we've got to kind of move away from that because that's a real dangerous situation where we'll end up with our local neighborhoods, whether it's rural or urban, dominated by vehicles with electrical cables dangling out of bedroom windows and across pavements, uh, causing no end of disruption for people who yeah, simply so want to walk around. Very good warnings on the EV thing. The six carbon budget says a 9% reduction in car trips and, and the maths of that is absolutely huge. Um, 1,700 people killed on Britain's, uh, England and Wales's roads last year. So, you know, how do we get to, to zero deaths by 2030, which is what the government has actually signed up to? Caroline, you, you, meant, you, you were talking about the NHS and, and linking up the health piece and there's the NHS has got a carbon footprint the size of Croatia. Um, you know, final thoughts from you. I'm due to become the chair of the Humber teaching NHSFT in the future, which is all focused on mental health and uh, community medicines. And I totally agree with you. I mean, it's a massive. And that's the other thing in all this. Who are the influencers? Who are the bigger influencers? Our size family is important, but actually health is massively important in this. And, um, you know, I fought my battles to get public health and mention as public health minister. So I think that's part of the answer to this. What I would ask really, Mary, is we need more rigour in this. Um, so, Pete, when I looked at the Sheffield City Region Action Travel Plan, I noticed that it said 4,000 people have made comments. I'd sort of like to know who those people are, because there's 250,000 adults that live in Doncaster, nearly a million across South Yorkshire. We've got to show the rigour and application to this in the same way there is to cancer treatment. Because if you don't, we don't win on public health grounds. That's my experience. So we need to really delve into these figures. And if we're not hearing from the people we most need to reach, we can't laud these figures in our publications. And I'm not having a go because there's a lot of good stuff in that plan. And that goes to cycling in, in Doncaster. Thank God we've had the Tour de Yorkshire through enough times. I would hope cycling's gone up. We're also pretty flat, but we're not a very diverse population. And I imagine some of our figures are offset by the more diverse communities in Rotherham and Sheffield, where we know within the Southeast Asian community there isn't as much cycling within those communities. So we have to have more rigor and more detail about who we are reaching and how they're responding. But I do fundamentally agree with uh, Richard, small changes can make a big difference. And that should be the starting point to lead on to bigger ambitions, I believe. 
Thank you for that. That's a brilliant um, focus on on the social justice side of things and and the and the, the power of small things all adding up to a very big change. Claire, final thoughts from you, and then if you go to the link in the chat, we can all go back to the main event. And I certainly have to re re uh, report back on that. So, um, Claire, over to you. Thank you. No, it's been a great discussion. I mean, I'm going to be very brief because I'm conscious that, of time. I think if we if we think that EVs are the solution to all of our, our ills, your know, health and you know air quality, we're just redecorating hell. You know, essentially, this is just more of the same. I mean, the active travel, the, the switch to sustainable travel has got to be at the heart of discussion as we go forward. I mean, we, I, we haven't really talked about EVs, but all the embedded carbon, I mean, they are a part of the solution, but they are a small part. Um, they are a, a, an important part, but we really have to, I just want to really endorse um, what's been said about the importance of putting public health at the heart of policy. I agree with the comment that it's not just a transport, it's a societal problem. Um, we've been building, a, and it is a whole mindset shift, a mindset shift that's needed. Um, so it's a big task. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. And, and Caroline's point about listening um, to, to, to the widest possible community, that's again something we're very keen on in Living Streets because the voices of children are always lost in, in these discussions and the voices of the frail elderly who don't have access to the to the Facebook and the Twitter accounts and really listening to the widest possible uh, group of people in the community is, is incredibly important. Thank you very much indeed to our panel, Caroline Flint, Pete Zanzotera, Richard Nixon, Claire Haig and Kerry McCarthy. Thank you to you for your attendance and um, that concludes our mini summit. Thank you all very much and I'll see you back on the main platform. I can't get back onto the main platform, so let's see if we can work this out. Oh, I can't to... get through. I'm not registered, I don't think. You're not registered. Um, is it asking you for uh, details? Oh, sorry, I can't hear you now. What's going on? Here we go. I'm back. I'm in it now. Oh, perfect. Are you managing to get on, Caroline? I'm not sure, actually. I, I'm doing the click. No. No? D don't worry, I've got to get a train. Oh, OK. <laughs> Lovely to see you, Caroline. Yeah, take care, Mary. Bye. Lots of love. Bye.